Hello, my name is Al Palmer. I want to do a little demonstration of how electricity is generated for consumer applications. I'm a retired electronics instructor and I wanted to put some of my uh, lectures on video so that you can see what I used to teach in my classroom. So to get into the generation of electricity, we have to understand a few principles. One of those is the shape of a magnetic field and how we can get a wire to move inside of it. So I'm going to use a simple bar magnet and a piece of paper and some iron filings to show you what the shape of a magnetic field in a bar magnet would look like. And if you look at these images, you can see where the magnetic lines of force leave the magnet. And in some cases, they come back to the middle. This magnet, this bar magnet I have, actually has more than one pole pair within the bar. So you see a north-south, north-south, north-south transition. But one end is north, I'm not sure which, and one end is south. And the magnetic lines of force from the ends of the magnet go around from one end of the magnet to the other. In order to generate electricity, we have to make a conductor cut these lines. Now, it's easier to do that if you can bend the horseshoe magnet, the bar magnet, into a horseshoe shape which is what I'm going to do right now. So I take this toy horseshoe magnet. I'm going to do the same experiment. And what you're going to find out is the magnetic lines of flux leave one end of the horseshoe magnet and go into the other end of the horseshoe magnet. And it gives you a stronger magnetic field right here. Now if I can spin a wire within that magnetic field, it will, because the ends are closer together, it's a stronger magnetic field and I have more current induced in the wire. So that's kind of the principle of operation behind some of these simpler generators that were used years ago. And I'm going to show you one of those as an example. This is a generator right here that was used in old-fashioned telephones. Now this generator used a horseshoe magnet like I just showed you. And it has a rotating magnetic field inside the air gap of the rotating magnet. Now, that this is many, many coils of wire, which induces a lot more current. The more turns, the more uh, voltage is generated. There's three principles that can determine how large of a voltage and the amount of current I can generate. One is the strength of these mag magnets the number of turns, and the speed at which I'm turning this. So there's a gear ratio here that makes it so that this coil spins very fast if I turn this crank. And so I have the conductors cutting the lines of force uh, very quickly. And these are older, more primitive magnets. They're not that powerful. This was a technology at the time, early 1900s. If I crank this, and I'm right here, so I spin this around, sorry. And if I crank this, you'll see that I can actually light this light up. Once again, the faster I turn this, or the stronger these magnets are, or the more number of turns there are, uh, the, the more current I can generate in the light bulb. On the end here is something called a leaf switch. And that's a switch that turns on when you turn this crank. And the object was, when you were using this in a telephone, is that it only connected itself to the wires while the crank was turning and as soon as you stopped turning the crank it took the voltage off the wires and removed itself from the circuit. So this is a primitive generator that generates an alternating current. And I want to show you an example of that with another version of the same thing. This is an older style, also a telephone generator. Horseshoe magnets, same gear ratio, same uh, spinning coil. I have a light in here that's a neon light. It's a, it, it's a type of gas discharge bulb. And it lights up according to the polarity of the voltage. So as I turn this crank, you will see, if you watch this light, that it lights up one side and then the other. And the object is, uh, this is generating. You can't see the light bulb. Yes. This is generating an alternating voltage depending on whether the coil is going past the north pole of the magnet or the coil is going past the south pole of the magnet. So as the coil spins, it generates um, positive and negative voltages with alternately light up the different halves of the, of the neon light. And so this is just a demonstration of alternating current. 
Later on, as, as cars and, and tractors and trucks became more um, important, we had to learn how to generate direct current so that uh, we could charge the batteries that were in the devices. So what I have here is the generator from an old Ford tractor. Now, if you look into the side of this generator, you see two electromagnets. These electromagnets took the place of the permanent magnets. Did the same thing. This is called the, the field magnet, makes the magnetic field. And when you spin this rotor inside the magnetic field, it generates a voltage. But here's something that's, that is a little bit different here. If you look down at this end of this, you see that there's a thing called a commutator at this end. Now, the commutator has brushes that come in contact with it. Maybe that's better from this angle. And these brushes don't make permanent contact. They only make contact to the copper slot that it's actually connected to. And the object of this is, as the coil goes past the north pole, it'll generate a positive voltage in one of these brushes or the other, depending on uh, the position of the magnet and stuff. And as that same uh, coil spins around 180 degrees and it makes a negative voltage, it gets picked up by the other brush. So as this spins, whichever coil is in contact with, let's say, the North Pole, puts out a positive voltage on one brush and a negative voltage on the other brush. And as it continues to spin by the fan belt, you know, from the motor and all that kind of stuff, it constantly is connecting one wire to a brush that's always positive and the other wire from the coil, which is always negative, to the opposite brush. So as it spins, these brushes are mechanically rectifying the voltage being generated. So that if I was to hook this to that light that you can see blinking the polarity, it would only blink on one side because the positive voltage would always be on one side of the bulb and the negative voltage would always be on the other side of the bulb. This is what you have to do if you want to charge batteries because you can't charge a battery with alternating current. It has to always be a higher voltage than the battery voltage and forcing electrons into the negative side of the battery or positive voltage to the positive side of the battery. So this was a, a primitive way of, of charging uh, the, the battery in a tractor or an old Ford car. And uh, this was run by the fan belt and, and, and kept the battery charged up. This alternator that you see here is rated, I think, at around 12 or or 15 amps. It's fairly low and the problem is that these brushes, if you start pulling lots of current out of these brushes, they start arcing pretty and, and, and will wear out quicker. So the next step that improved our ability to charge batteries, we did two major things. One, we turned the generator inside out and what that means is instead of having the permanent magnet on the outside, we put the permanent magnet on the inside. I can't find, find my right here, sorry. So the magnet, instead of being stationary, is now being rotated. So what we have here, I'm gonna move this, because it's too thick, is a rotating magnet. Now, is this in the right spot? Okay. So what happens is we have, instead of brushes or a commutator, we have what's called slip rings. Slip rings are right here, and you put DC into here. That's continuous piece of metal all the way around, so it never changes polarity. What happens is that little bit of DC that comes in here is wrapped around these wires inside this rotor, and it magnetizes one side of this rotor in one polarity and the other side of the rotor in the other polarity. And these fingers then, which are here and here and here and here, will be alternate magnetic polarity. So if this one was north, this one was coming from the other side of the magnet, would be south, north, south, north, south. So as you spin this, you have alternating north and south magnetic field on these little fingers that come up f from the opposite sides of the coil. So now what we're doing is we're rotating the field instead of rotating the magnet we're going the coils we're going to generate the power in. So by rotating the field, we can also adjust the strength of the field with the voltage regulator and that controls the amount of current that goes into these slip rings. So this rotating magnetic field is then used to induce a voltage into these coils right here. 
Now, these coils are going to produce alternating current just like the spinning magnets did, the spinning coils did inside the horseshoe magnets. But I'm going to have alternating current induced in here. But here's the kicker inside here, we have what's called solid state diodes. Solid state diodes are like check valves for alternating current, and they only allow electricity to flow in one direction. So even though alternating current is being generated in these coils, the diodes are rectifying the current. So instead of mechanical rectification, we have solid state rectification. These diodes are also visible on the back, and you can see them so that they have plenty of airflow for cooling. And this alternator, even though it's smaller than the first one I brought up there, is rated at over 100 amps of current. This is a high current alternator. It generates a relatively low voltage, but tremendous amount of current because of the diodes. In this case, there are six diodes, one, two, three, four, five, six. This is a three phase generator, which has two diodes on each phase, and that produces pulsating direct current to charge the battery and run other high current applications like rear window defoggers and seat heaters and stuff like that. So the concept of spinning the field magnet, instead of having the field magnet be a permanent stationary horseshoe magnet, allowed the generator to become smaller and more powerful. And also it was necessary to have the solid state diodes. Now, the same concept is used, a little bit different, but if you're going to generate electricity for your house, this is the same concept. This is the field magnet that's used in a household generator. It's got one pole pair. Instead of all those little fingers with north, south, north, south, it's got a north side and a south side. I'm not sure which is which. And it's got slip rings on one end to apply DC current to here, which forces this to become magnetized. There's also permanent magnets inside here that are, that are mounted in here so that this generator is self-starting. So that when you spin it, these little permanent magnets right here will um, energize the coils enough to produce enough power to run the DC into the slip rings and this becomes a fairly formidable magnet fairly powerful look at the number of turns that are in here and the size of this magnetic field so this thing starts turning from a 10 horsepower gasoline engine and it induces voltages into the stator so once again this is a this is a generator where the field coil current is rotating and the coils here have the voltage generated into them that supply power to your house. This is a five or six thousand watt generator. It runs on a 10 horsepower, you know, Honda or Briggs and Stratton engine or something. Now, the power in your house is not DC, so there's no diodes in here. This is generating alternating current and um, you get one cycle for each revolution of the field magnet. So if you want 60 cycles a second, you have to spin the field magnet, the field coil, inside here 60 times a second. So 60 revolutions a second is 3,600 revolutions a minute. So the motor has to run at 3,600 RPM in order to produce 60 cycles a second. So this would be a good substitute for the electricity generated to run your house. And it's very similar to what the power company does, only they would have in a generator, instead of something I can barely lift, the actual rotor would be the size of a school bus, which would also be the rotating field. And the stator would be the, the pickup coils to power a city would also be wrapped around the, the rotor. So if you just size this up with giant turbines and stuff, you can power, you know, whole cities with this. But the concept of generating electricity is the same all the way from the simple generator, from the Ford tractor or the telephone generator. We just started moving the magnets around and moving the coils around and then using diodes if you want DC or just pulling off the AC right off the coils if you're trying to generate alternating current, like is what you have in your house. Thanks for watching. Subscribe if you like my videos. Thanks.